Bula Bula, everyone, and welcome to Survivor NSFW special coverage of the new Amazon Prime reality competition that everyone I know is talking about, World's Toughest Race Eco Challenge Fiji. Johnny Fairplay, Matt Bischoff, and I are here. We're going to break everything down, and joining us, we have two competitors from World's Toughest Race. They were on different teams, but they're both ultra marathoners. We have the Speedo-clad Corey Woltering from Team Onyx, the first all-black adventure racing team that really stole the show, and you may recognize her from her time on the Asaga Tribe, what I consider one of the greatest starting tribes in Survivor history, Samantha Gay from Team Aussie Rescue. Corey, Samantha, how are you guys doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks for having us. That's pretty strong, Zach. I mean, <laughs> you as a, as a huge Survivor fan, obviously, making that statement is, uh, I, I trust your opinion on that. Zach lies. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, that's my gimmick. Zach, Zach's, Zach's here to actually tell the truth. So huge words, Samantha, <laughs> kudos. <laughs> that, well, I think everyone was nut jobs on my tribe, but uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we'll talk a little bit about how these two ended up on World's Toughest Race, uh, and then we'll dive into the first couple episodes because I know a lot of people may be listening to this and haven't watched it yet. This is a show you got to check out if you're a reality TV fan. This is sort of like the predecessor to Survivor. This is what Mark Burnett was working on before he did Survivor. And this is a pretty epic thing for me to get to see. I remember growing up watching Survivor and hearing Ethan Zahn was on this show called Eco Challenge. There's no way to check that out. There's no way to watch it. Here it is on Amazon. Samantha, can you just tell us a little bit about how you ended up on this show? I know that you've done some epic things in your past, but what led you to World's Toughest Race? Yeah, I uh, I remember watching the, the promo video and, and I watched Eco Challenge back in the day, but I watched it before I was an adventure racer, before I did endurance sports, back when I was like a kid who was actually terrible at sport. And so I, but I was still fascinated by these people that seemed, they seemed indestructible to be honest, until they became destructible. Um, and I just remember being really captivated by it as a kid. And then when I saw the promo video, I had a, a six-month-old at the time, and I, it was the first time after having my son, Harry, that I was like, I want to get back in the game. Like, I want to get back. I want to train. I'm now – I've got the fire in the belly again, and I, and I want to kind of prep for it. So um, my husband's like, I want to do it too. And I was like, oh, I don't normally race with my husband. And I met my husband on Survivor. Uh, and, you know, I guess interestingly, part of me went – Mm, what's happened poorly in my relationships in the past? I've probably not t taken them along for like the, the life transforming um, challenges. And so I was like, okay, cool. I'll get two of my other adventure racing mates applied, got on. And it was awesome. It was really, really cool. So with it, adventure it, racing, there's, I mean, Survivor and all these other reality shows, sorry, Johnny, you, you're competing for money, right? So like with adventure racing, what is the goal? Is it just to, have the experience of a lifetime, the competitiveness in you, or is there another ulterior motive of why you would want to do something like this? Because a lot of people, hey, I want to go on Survivor because I want the million dollars, right? So what is your main motivation? It's It fascinates me. Some people can't even get off the damn couch to go change their laundry. And then when I'm watching the world's toughest race, I'm, I'm completely blown away at how insane you guys are. Uh, for me, even with Survivor, I'd say like I'm, I'm chasing experiences that really um, test me, that place me in situations that are completely unfamiliar where I have to dig deep and find something that I don't normally have to access in normal life you to see how I'm going to cope in that situation. Um, Jeff Probst. Oh, you, you just, you just, you're trying to say some Australian accent? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm doing my Jeff Probst. you got to dig deep. <laughs> but you do. You, uh, and I think it's pretty cool to be able to be in the wilderness with your mates and it's actually how you work together which determines if you're actually going to take the next step forward. So I, I the concept of it is incredibly exciting for someone who is an endurance athlete and who loves the sport of adventure racing. Yeah. I, I have a quick question. You, you said your your son's name is Harry. Is, is he named after Dirty Harry from, a, from no. Survivor Australia? I hope not. He was, he was, he was born before that that um, season came to air. So I'll say okay. no. <laughs> she, funny. she actually saw my beard years ago and said, man, that guy's hairy. Yeah. Oh, that's actually a good kid name. Oh, wow. There you go. I knew it had to be survivor related in some, some shape or form. <laughs> 
So how did it go having Mark out there? You talked about being a little leery of bringing your partner on the race with you. How was that relationship as you were struggling through the hike a bike and all the difficult moments? Yeah, for people who are watching it, I mean, just think about what it would be like to have the person that you love the most in an experience where you're really being tested the most. The worst. You're <laughs> it's hard. I mean, your tolerances are really low. I think sometimes it's almost, you know, I know Corey had some strangers in his teams in many respects, but you're you're a little bit um, kinder and you're more careful with what you say. But surprisingly, it went really, really, really well. There was only one moment when, toward the very end of the race where we had to like set up our stand up paddle boards for what felt like the 20th time. And they're really hard, like being on the stand up paddle boards hard, but actually pumping them up to be like, inflated enough is actually really um exhausting yeah. and he's a big guy he's six three i'm under five foot and i was definitely looking at him coming come on mate like give me a hand and pump up this stand up paddle board and he's like you can do it yourself i'm like no help me <laughs> and that was the only moment for like a, a a minute section where we had this little bit of tension and then our teammates just cracked a joke and we just let it go so i, I actually feel incredibly grateful i got to have that experience with him Real quick, Corey, before before we get to how you got involved, uh, uh, peek behind the curtain. I, I was on Survivor, Pro Islands, and then later on Fans versus Favorites. And on Pro Islands, I had Burton Roberts uh, on my tribe, and we had just finished the challenge. And Mark Burnett is talking with uh, me and Burton, and uh, and and uh, Mark Burnett was like, you know, what did you think of that challenge? That was, and, and uh, Burton's like, yeah, that was a tough. He goes, almost as tough as Eco Challenge, huh? And and Burton shoots him this look, like, shut the fuck up, <laughs> because no one knew that he had done Eco Challenge. And, but you know, I quickly discovered right then and there, and I was like, so Burton, want to chat? <laughs> and he was like, oh, I can't believe he did. And I was just like, dude, it's. I mean, like, like you look at Burton, like. I, I would have been disappointed if Burton hadn't have done an eco challenge. So it wasn't like, oh, you're out of here. I you know? <laughs> so, but uh, but yeah. It, so I did later have conversations, you know, privately. But and, and Burton was just like, it was the toughest thing I've ever done in my life. Like, <laughs> like this Survivor's tough eco challenge trumps Survivor as far as I mean, it's called the world's toughest race for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Corey, conversely, uh, Sam's out there with close friends, with her partner. You're out there with people that you maybe haven't known all that much. I peek behind the curtain. I listened to a podcast that you two were on just earlier today, uh, the Samantha Gash <laughs> podcast. Uh, so go check that out if you're interested. And I was hearing a little bit, but I didn't get to finish it. Corey, how was your team assembled and how did you get involved in this after all of your ultra running? Yeah, um, so our team captain, Clifton, um, was basically on Instagram one day and he's like, I want to put together an all black, um, team to race eco challenge. So he sends me an inbox message and he's like, Hey, uh, would you like to race eco challenge? It's going to be in Fiji. He's like, Hmm. Okay. And he's like, by the way, I'm putting together an all black team. I thought you'd like it. And I found a couple other people. So here we go like all right i mean i don't know really what i'm getting into but here we go and and you guys both have the most infectious smiles i've ever seen i mean like watch like anyone watching the show looking for a bad guy you guys ain't it i mean <laughs> you guys just take turn like i'm looking at the screen i'm just like well gosh darn it i'm rooting for them <laughs> it's hard not to root for every single one of those teams out there there's a couple I didn't like. Uh, there's, there's <laughs> one for me. The the uh, the uh, Survivor US team. If I had seen them, I would have rooted against them. <laughs> hey, hey, they saved the day later on. They uh, you know they Rhino turned his bike to somebody. So yeah. Helpful. Yeah. So way to go, yeah. Rhino. It had to have been Rhino's unused bike that 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 got sent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so harsh. He was very kind to give his bike over. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't pay for it. Come on. <laughs> uh, well, that an act of kindness. Yeah, How and, and, and honestly, Guatemala is a much better home for that bike than whatever Rhino would have done with it in Santa Cruz. Let's be honest. <laughs> Uh, but how expensive is it to get into adventure racing? There's so much gear involved and so much movement. This is just such an epic production. How does uh, the financing of that work for you guys? This is my first one. So, um, yeah, I don't know. They're just like, you need this. And I'm like, okay, 
<laughs> so it's one of yeah. those things like so like I was on this TV show on uh, TLC Network in America uh, called Miami Inc. So I applied for the show. I got on the show. This is pre Survivor because uh, I played Survivor years later. But my friends asked me like, oh, man, you must have made so much money being on the show. I'm like, actually, dude, like I had to buy my own plane ticket to Miami. I had to pay fifteen hundred bucks for my tattoo, which is actually a pretty good deal because I got a whole back piece. But it's expensive. So with you guys, is there sponsors involved um, with the bikes and the gear? And I see you, Corey, have like a North Face shirt. Uh, what is the deal as far as that goes? I mean, there's 66 teams. I would think that it would be kind of a lot of money just to sponsor a small portion of that. But is any of your gear donated by some of these companies? I'll go to the question of um, is the sport expensive? I mean, it can be very expensive, uh, but if you're doing like a small, like a two-day adventure race or a, a day adventure race, like the fundamentals are you need a bike, but the question is like there's a big range of bikes that you could get. Um, mm -hmm. Often you can hire um, a kayak, which is one of the typical disciplines that you do in adventure racing. And the trekking stuff, it's, more, you know, obviously just shoes. It's what you might use if you were running. Um, it's every time you do a different race, the specifications become that little bit more um, required for the location. So Fiji, you know, we had to think about the, the humidity. We had to think about the, you know, potentially the mosquitoes. Um, but there was a lot of, we had a lot of climbing. So even people who adventure race might not have had the specific ascenders um, and the technical gear. So it can be expensive. We were very lucky um, that we got a stipend um, where we did Eco Challenge from Amazon. But I will also tell you that we didn't sign up knowing there was going to be a stipend. So every team who got into Fiji had committed to covering the race themselves. In fact, we'd already paid the first instalment of the registration. And so me as a like obsessed adventure racer loves that everyone was there because they were willing to put their skin in the game. And it was just we were lucky down the track that we found out that there was going to be um, a bit of help. Did, did you get a refund? <laughs> They just deduct. I think they deduct it. I can't even remember now. Like it, it was. I can just tell you the logistics were immense for this. Like you got your training, but I know that we averaged about five hours of logistical prep a day, particularly in like the last couple of months of it. And Corey, you said this is your first event adventure race you've ever done. Samantha obviously has had experience. What was this like going into this, never doing it? Were you terrified? Was it scary? Or like kind of go through your mindset? Um, you know, it's really hard to be scared of what you don't know. Um, and I so, think most people would say the opposite. That's impressive. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, for me, it was like, all right, I know I'm going to be in Fiji and they told us kind of what we're going to be doing. Um, and so I'm like, all right, let's, let's go for it. So you, you saved money on pants. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, so it's one of those things where it's like I spent the first half of the year still racing as a professional ultra runner for the North Face. And then come like June, I was like, all right, I just need to put running on the back burner and basically focus on this next set of skills that I didn't necessarily have. Um, and so because of that, like I really couldn't be scared of much of it going into it because I'm like, I don't know what we're going to see. It. I mean, and it was also my first time doing like a multi day race. So. Yeah. Were you, were you able to bring on North Face as a, as a team sponsor? Yeah. So they gave us a lot of our gear, um, just like clothing and packs and all of that stuff. And then uh, we had a bunch of other sponsors like uh, for bikes and lights and all of that stuff. So like for, for me, like it was actually rather cheap to race this, which I was really excited that I didn't have to use like my, the North Face travel budget for it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as I learned from the Fijian kids, uh, you don't even need shoes for, for the eco challenge. So if you guys do it again, just leave those at home. You're <laughs> Can you fathom? They're, 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 they're warriors. I don't know how, how they do that. <laughs> could, could you fathom doing one checkpoint of the race without shoes? On water. Uh, <laughs> any, on, <laughs> land. <laughs> on land, could you imagine? I mean, cause like I'm watching, I'm just like, this is amazing. I mean, yeah, like we're, we're not built that like we're not raised that way. We're yeah. raised with shoes as soon as we uh, can learn to walk. So you or become before. a you become a <laughs> yeah, you become a product of your environment, and and therefore like that's just 
you know, I couldn't imagine doing a stage of the race without shoes. Yeah. And Corey, you said, I mean, you guys were the first all African American team in a race like this. So after this is all said and done and it drops on Amazon, how many people are reaching out to you? Cause this is that, that's a big deal. And especially in the crazy world we're living in, a lot of talk is going on about race and we got all this coronavirus stuff. So kind of tell me like how this has been post race for, for that. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, it's been pretty amazing, like hundreds of messages a day, um, just of people reaching out being like, thank you guys for, you know, sharing your message and telling your story. And like, it's really important. And then at the same time, I also get a bunch of shit posters that are like, what does being black have to do with it? And like, oh, well, you know, you guys are a racist team because you didn't let white people be on it. Oh. And like, but how am I a racist team if we didn't have white people on it? Because there are like 20 other teams from the US that were all white. So please explain that one to me. But yeah, so I've been getting like hundreds of positive messages and then like daily though, like someone's like, fuck off. Yeah. Do you just block that? That's my, I, I block. I love my favorite thing to do in life is to block on social media. I mean, <laughs> it's um, like, <laughs> yeah, like blocking them is fun, but I've started calling them out on social media. So like, I'll take a screenshot of it and post it to my Instagram story. And I'm just like, Hey, like, look at this racist piece of shit. Good. I, Good. I don't, yeah. yeah. I don't, it's like, it's amazing in reality TV. It's like you're going out there, whether it's Survivor, Big Brother, World's Toughest Race, there's going to be haters. And it's like, why Like, why do people feel the need to do that? But it happens to all of us, especially, yeah. I mean, Johnny's a bad guy. I'm the nice guy from the Survivor <laughs> world. So Johnny gets hate all the time. But for people to say, oh, you guys are racist because you don't have a white person on your team, that's absolutely ridiculous. And comments like that are the problem. Yes. So those, you know what I'm That's saying? It's a thousand percent the problem. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, I don't get it. It's not that hard of a concept, people. It, it's keyboard cowards. I like I I don't I don't know what what world they live in that 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 they envision the world in that way it 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 it, it hurts me i mean like uh, on the on this past season of survivor my good friend wendell holland you know he became a bad guy on on the season you know he, he was a super good guy on on his on on ghost island and for winners at war you know he gets the the, the bad guy edit and he would post on social media and, and he 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 enjoyed it and uh but he would he would post a, you know a picture with a smirk he was like here's one for you and it would immediately be 3,000 comments, 1,500 of which would be the N-word, and then the other 1,500 would be, you know, Nick Wilson, who was on his tribe, who lives in Kentucky and is a Republican. Nick Nick Wilson's a racist. And it's just like, why are either one of these comments on this picture? Like, you know, like, I just wanted to go through every single, I'm just like, block, block, block. I'm like, but at the same time, like, you know, I guess if, if I'm blocking them, how am I, you know, how can I feed them education to, to, you know, help them escape their ignorance? Right. So. I'm well, shocked that on a show like World's Toughest Race, which I think <laughs> is so incredible at telling different people's stories and showing just, I, I cried like 30 times watching <laughs> it. It was ridiculous. I mean, I, it just really moved me to see so much representation and so many people fighting for so many important things. For people to turn that negative, uh, unbelievable. Corey, yeah. I'll do this. Like, uh, like if, if, if team that I'm researching a guest, uh, and the first thing that comes up is a Guardian article. Uh, I usually interview reality TV folks, so uh, I think you're doing well, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, like Team Endure hits the screen on on uh, World Toughest Race, and like my my eyes are are, are predetermined to start producing tears. I'm like, <laughs> stop it! Yeah, I mean that's the cool thing about this race. We all went in kind of you're not competing against other people, and in no. fact, very quickly you're rooting for other teams. And there were many times out in the course where I, you know, you'd see a producer, and it's not like you had much of an interaction, but you'd go, "How's this team? And how's this team?" and you want to know how they're going and the reality is you actually want everyone to finish. And I think there's very rare occasions where you're in a competitive environment, but you actually don't care about that notion of competition. I mean, if you're at the front, obviously you're wanting to, to win it. But I'd say like after really like after the top 10, it's like, I just want everyone to make it. Yeah. I mean, like, like you, 
the tone is set so early on with Team Endure and, and Team Stray Dogs, you know, just wondering where the other is at. And you're just like, just keep, <laughs> go faster, <laughs> go faster. <laughs> <laughs> we love Stray Dogs. <laughs> Well, you talk about how close some of the teams are. What was it like before you started filming? How much interaction was there with for the athletes with other teams? Mm, not a huge amount. I mean, not from our end. Like, all the Australian teams knew each other besides Team Mad Myers, actually, um, the team that you see quite a bit on the show. They were the new – out of all the Australian teams, that was the team that had an adventure race before. Um, oh. And everyone else uh, had done – quite a bit of racing so we all knew each other and we were all doing races uh in Australia um prepping for it so there was a lot of sharing of um training there was a lot of sharing of like upskilling with navigation and climbing and resourcing on like navigation like compass equipment and stuff like that so yeah with Australia and there was, and then you might have had conversations with the team on the other side of the world but I don't think we really knew who was doing it till we got there yeah, I, I can imagine you know, that your mindset, you know, if you're new, if you're new and if you're, you know, an asshole American, you know, you're just like, we're going to beat them and we're going to be great. And, you know, and, and the interact, you know, just glares. And then, you know, 20 minutes into the race, you're just like, man, who can we be friends with? <laughs> man, I, I tell you what, looking at this show from a perspective as a Survivor fan, it gave me those feelings of early survivor fair play, the things that I loved, the scenery. And then as we see like people helping out, like these school children running down the hills to greet people and people helping out with these uh, bamboo boats and stuff like that. Those are the things that we learned when survivor went to other places, fair play. That's what I miss about survivor. And, and I love seeing that feed. I'm like, I'm telling my family, like, Fiji is like the most badass place on the planet. I want to go there. What amazed me, Matt, is uh, that they were able to work in all this culture and see the beautiful diversity that is Fiji. Survivor's been filming in Fiji for like five years, and we've seen none of this. They're hiding. <laughs> <laughs> no, why, 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 how can Bear Grylls find these people and Jeff Probst can't? <laughs> well, <laughs> Bear Grylls rides a helicopter way cooler than Jeff Probst. I'll say that. And he does a back. I was like, I was looking at my wife. I'm like, this motherfucker does a backflip off the helicopter like a badass. I was like, this guy is like 50 times better than Jeff freaking Probst. This hey, don't, hey that's my good friend, Jeff Probst. Hey, Jeff, uh, if you're watching, I, I think you ride a helicopter and jet ski probably 10 times better than Bear Grylls, but I've never seen Bear Grylls. We, uh, we were really lucky. We got to go through over 100 villages. Um, and so just imagine the logistical preparation because it's not like we were just going there. Like it, all the work had been done by the executive and the production team beforehand for us to have permission to do that. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was really important for that production team for us to have that experience but to do it with respect. Uh, and like they opened our doors for us. Like we would be sleeping in their in their homes, in, the, in their beds, and they would be looking after us. It was that is the the unique thing about adventure racing and, and particularly eco challenge that you get ingrained into the place that you are, which means you have respect for it. Yeah. And, and how, how inspiring was it when you would, when you would go through those villages and you would have, you know, the kids and families just cheering you on. I mean, like, was, was that like that, that extra thing that you needed at that moment, pretty much every single time it happened? Absolutely. Just every single time. Yeah. I mean, as I said, just watching at home, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a half marathon runner, <laughs> and, you it. know, and, and I know, you know, when you have the, when you have those clusters that, you know, at the corners, you know, and, you know, and, and you know, and, and you're looking for that one funny sign to lift you up, but, but, you know, just a little kid, you know, just, just looking at you and, and clapping and give you the thumbs up. That means for me personally, I know what that means. And, you know, and I'm not, you know, dragging a bike through, through peanut butter, uh, mud. <laughs> so, so, and, and, and I, as I said, I, I, I think, uh, Amazon and, and, and Mark Burnett and, and everyone that came together to make this, I, I feel they really captured, uh, if, and, and please tell me if I'm wrong. I, I, I felt they, they, they captured the, the raw emotion that was there, you know, throughout this, you know, life changing and, 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 you know, extremely tough race. 
A hundred percent. Yeah, I was. I, mean, I was in the race, and I'm watching it back. I was. I was in tears watching the the experiences that people were having, um, and it for all the teams that were a part of it, it it reminded them of what their experiences were like that out there. But we're pretty sleep deprived. There's a lot you don't remember. Um, it becomes a blur. And I remember saying, oh, I'm just I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of seeing the, the, the pieces of the dots all come together um, and to see it from the helicopter, see those drone shots because you're just so insignificant out on that course. Um, you know, we're so small and then you kind of realise the big, the big picture play of it. So I want to ask... So episode one, obviously New Zealand's badass. Uh, we got Bend racing from Oregon in first place, and well, you're for, you're going across, while. yeah, for a while, right? But you're you're on those like uh, I, I call them like catamarans. I don't know what you actually call them, but you could either row or you could put up a sail and use the wind. And many people were asked, "Hey, why didn't you put up the sail?" So in your guys' experience, was that even an option or was the wind so little that you couldn't even use Mother Nature to propel your boat? We did not have wind, or at least in our experience. So so we, uh, it was not an option we, for you guys. You guys let's just row this thing. Yeah. No, we put, the sail, we put the sail up. You did put the sail up. And now, did you did, catch yeah. wind? We went kind of slightly across um, and got a little bit of wind, and I think it helped a little bit. Uh, we didn't come in in a particularly great position, but like uh, being on the water is not particularly our greatest discipline. So we kind of knew on the trekking leg would be a bit more favourable for us, so let's just take off a little bit of intensity of the paddle. And there were times where we could actually, only two people would have to paddle whilst two people could drink. Um, and we would still move. So maybe we wouldn't be moving as far as if we were all four paddling, but we definitely did not expend as much energy uh, getting to the, to the island. You, did, you didn't um, uh, team bend it. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. asked him. I mean, we kind of we were in the like the the back, the back third coming into the island, and we passed Ben Racing, which if it gives you any idea, like how long they were. Like I just saw these figures on on the on the mountain, and I was like a team's already having a break like what's going on and like it was a bit confusing i was like you don't really sleep the first night um and yeah but they did amazing to kind of get back like to have that absolute blowout it's it's a um they are experienced enough to know that things can change and you can slump and you can come back i mean he, he suffered heat stroke i mean like that <laughs> and they're such strong paddlers they go from first to 58th to 15th in like two episodes. Uh, it's incredible yeah. on their covering. You guys are both uh, ultra runners. Their their strength was clearly paddling. Is there a skill set that is like the primo skill set you want on adventure racing? Or do you want a nice balance spread about your team? You, you want to be a jack of all trades. I, I'm good at video games. Do you think that'll help? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Okay, cool. I, I You know what? Zach, sign us up. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna need one person with the three of us who knows what they're doing. Well, you uh, got. You, yeah. Well, we have we've established the team captain based on the video gaming and uh, Samantha's endorsement. And and Corey, I know would love that just to see you quit earlier than he did. <laughs> Do you guys? You talk about sleep deprivation, which man, I tell you, when you're tired and grumpy, especially in a team environment, that can be crazy. Do you guys? train on lack of sleep yeah like you know what i mean like before you go on the race how do you do that part of it do you just like go running in the middle of the night like explain that um well i do some like overnight running just to get ready for like 100 mile races when you're going to be navigating and running at night um but i wouldn't say that i necessarily trained for sleep deprivation uh, but like the longest stretch that I had been up before this race was like 52 hours straight with no sleep. So um, like, it's not like it was that foreign to me. Wow. If I, if I told you that I was going to kick you in the balls, do you <laughs> want me to kick you in the balls first before you, I'm going to do it for the, no. for the real time? <laughs> yeah. Depends on how much I pay you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reality is it's yeah. gonna suck every single time yeah. so you you don't really train for it per se um because you almost it 
that that part of the sport is not particularly healthy. And so you want to get into the start line of the race as healthy as possible, um, having had good sleep, good nutrition, good hydration, um, no injuries at bay. Like it, the challenge of an adventure race, like an ultra marathon, is getting to the start line in, in really good shape. But what you do want to train is, if you can, having done like a, a smaller adventure race beforehand, because that tests your gear, it tests your team dynamics, and invariably throughout that, you, you'll do a bit of sleep deprivation and it'll just remind you how bad it is. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. So, so we're what I mean, like we're watching you guys test your your bodies to its limits on on you know each mm-hmm. leg of, of this thing. So, but you'll see, like you know, like like Team New Zealand, you know, in first place, you know, like you know, day three on two and a half hours sleep, and then you know, and potentially they make a you know a navigation error. How much of that is that sleep deprivation that that that's kicking in at that point? Like you know, as the race goes on, like is is your is your mind leaving you through throughout this thing, or or is it just go in and out in waves? It, it, or not it depends. At all. No, like firstly, it would depend on the skill of the navigator. So, Team New Zealand have an incredible navigator, but even incredible navigators can make mistakes. That's just a bad decision. And then obviously sleep deprivation, you know, they say, I think we just one or two nights of not having sleep. It's the equivalent of having X amount of um, alcoholic beverages. So obviously your, your judgment is impaired when you're, when you're looking at the maps. We made a mistake on the first SUP. We did a left-hand turn like team out there, which you would have seen. And we had an extra 8K to our stand-up paddle board, which was over a marathon in distance. And we were paddling upstream before, like, it, it, yeah, it's really it's really crappy when you make a mistake, but you also, again, you go into the race knowing you're going to make mistakes and it's how the team keeps light and just moves on with it. You know, a team that kind of starts to have a fight because they made a bad nav decision isn't the most cohesive of teams. I, so, like, when, you, when you're racing, I mean, there's, what, 66 teams out there. Do you, don't you try to be near another team so you can kind of see where they're going or are you like, no, 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 let, let's, 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 let's make our space because well, I would try to be near at least, I would try to be near two other teams. And then if they split off, you know, look at each other and go, which one do you think is smarter? Johnny, and then you're I, letting us on the next one. If you say this, like, come on, what's that? you're trying to cheat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it just, I, I don't know what Corey was for him, but it depends what your experience, your team wants. Like we actually love being out in the wilderness alone. And in fact, we do what we can to kind of be on our own for most yeah, of it. I, I we like want we, would, yeah. Yeah. I felt like some teams would do that. Like I'm not that guy. Like I'm just like, all right, which, you know, like I, I'm, I'm looking for footprints. <laughs> yeah. And, and that uh, you do that. I mean, but go and watch the rest of the show and you'll actually see <clears throat> maybe something like that happening um, in the race. Oh, okay. Spoiler mm-hmm. alert that I haven't seen. So, so. <laughs> Corey, Corey, where where are you at on that? Are you are you trying to hang near someone, or are you do you want you want that adventure all on your own as well? Um, I'll trust our navigator. I mean, I am okay. not the navigation person, so um, I can I can tell you how far we've gone if we're on land. I can tell you exactly how far we've gone without having to like look at a GPS or anything. But you know, you need to tell me make a right hand turn or a left hand turn. I'll just tell you when to do it. So we see Team Endure, and we we have this man who's recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's early onset, and he's doing this with his son. He's normally with Team Stray Dogs. This automatically made me emotional just watching this. As a dad to my kids and, and seeing this, did you guys have any knowledge of, of that situation prior to the race? Because as a viewer – it seemed like, wow, when this uh, guy's telling the cameraman this, it's almost like the first time anyone's finding out about it. I, well, we knew. We knew. You knew. Now, how bad? I mean, is that something that um, could really be dangerous in a race like this? I mean, Survivor, you go through all these – um, you got to go to the doctor and you got to go get a physical. You got to make sure you're in top mental and physical shape for Survivor. And when I watch the world's toughest race, I'm like, this seems way harder than Survivor. Yeah, so, it is. So with someone 
like him, how dangerous is it for him versus just someone that doesn't have that condition? I mean, could he forget to know how to ride a bike in the middle? You I know mean, what I mean? Like, I, I don't, I don't know the, I don't know the levels of how bad you never it was. forget how to ride a bike, Matt. That's why it's. <laughs> and this is this That's is the thing, thing like we'll forget. Yeah. This is a sport where it's about you and your team. Like mm-hmm. you and your team make these decisions, um, and it's not for like Corey or my team to kind of go. They weren't meant to be there. They shouldn't have put themselves through that stress. And obviously, when we're watching it back as viewers, there's probably so much that we also don't know as well. Right. Um, right. But what I do know is that like he's he had done pretty much every eco challenge with stray dogs. Um, mm-hmm. His son is up a gun adventure racer and was meant to be, you know, kind of a, an elite team and they chose to do it together and that's what their them and their family did and their teammates seemed to be completely on board with what was their team's mission. Mm-hmm. And you didn't see any division in that team. You saw them working together every step of the way and, yeah, they were amazing. That, that's, really the be- amazing. that's the beauty of the did show. You know, did you know that out there or not until you watched? Uh, all I knew um, is that that Mark that that they had that um, he had Alzheimer's. Okay. Sorry, that Macy had Alzheimer's, and that um, the te- the, his son was doing it with him. That's okay. all we knew. What What about you, Corey? About about the same info, or um, I didn't know anything about anybody that was racing because, like, <laughs> this is just not my sport. So uh, we got hit up on Instagram and showed up and <laughs> and left his pants at home. So, we love you for that. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of funny. Like I didn't know anything. It's wild. So so yeah. watching the show, are you just like, holy shit? How cool are these stories? Uh, absolutely. And then also like for our pre-race interviews, um, on the little bus ride to it, I was sitting next to Nathan. And like, I had no idea who he was. And so he's just telling me stories about racing and stuff. And I'm like, cool. Like, sounds like fun. Like, hmm, okay. Nathan, who's introduced as like the Michael Jordan of uh, <laughs> racing. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a couple of logistical questions that I was dying to know as I was watching it. Um, what was the food situation? What were you guys eating? Ugh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, like canned tuna and like almonds. Okay, that sounds we, like that sounds like freaking delicious treats. If I was on Survivor, oh if yeah, someone, if someone's like, I got canned tuna and almonds, I would be like, you are the greatest person I've ever met in my entire life. We have an alliance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I mean, not rooting you out for three days. Yeah. <laughs> c- c- contrasting with Survivor, it's pretty awesome. Um, because but you have to carry it. Uh, and, and then, you know, everything you have in that pack, you make pretty good decisions of if I'm taking X, Y, Z and it, it adds, you know, a couple of extra pounds, what's that going to do to my energy levels along the way? So everything's strategy. Um, our team only took like snack food out on course. And then we said, whenever we got to one of the main checkpoints, that's when we had our freeze dried meals, which meant sometimes we were out for two days, just having snack food. Um, bars or you know we love these like little Vegemite crisp things that you guys would find awful um, I love Vegemite, so. <laughs> you know but like a salt vinegar chips and like you like we had a lot of s- sweet stuff and it reminded me actually what you really crave out there is savory um, you know because you want that salt you really because you're depleting particularly in Fiji like you're losing so much salt with the sweat and all the movement um, you've got to replace it somehow did, did the Fijians offer you any food, like if you'd stay at their house or whatever, or were you scared? It was just like, ooh, I can't risk the diarrhea or something. Where, where, where were you at on that? Oh, they did offer food, yeah. And did you accept? Yeah. I didn't, but my teammates did. I'm I'm a little bit more careful. Like you do so much work to get to the start line. I've got a bit more of a delicate stomach. My team were going for everything. They just did not care. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then how much were you guys sleeping at night? You talked a little bit about the sleep deprivation, but some teams are saying like one hour. And then there are a couple of teams that I think got like eight full hours of rest. Or some more the- team and <laughs> team endure. They, I think they took naps. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what were your guys teams approaches to that? Um, I think that we got maybe four hours in the first three days. 
Um, and then we finally took like a five hour stop at camp two. I think it was where we, where we slept for like five hours that night. So that was pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, the first three days were a little rough. So how hard was it? I see team New Zealand, you got to find these medallions and it's nighttime and these dudes have to dive down in the ocean. And I'm like thinking I would be terrified of sharks or other sea creatures at nighttime in the water or finding these medallions in general, how difficult was that? I think that first one that you're talking about, the medallion, it wasn't like easy to find it. Um, I think every person who volunteered to do it from the team was actually really stoked to get into the water and do that because it's exciting. Like because you're so tired, your brain is switching off and in the middle of the night you're used to sleeping. So anything that can fire you up, ignite energy, you kind of want to get on board with. So the person who went into the water, I, I reckon they were pepped up for the next section of the, the paddle. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, the way we kind of just chose to do it is whoever had a moment out on that leg, they were the person that got to fetch the um, the medallion. So on one of them, there was a lot of like river crossing stuff and like I find it quite hard to do river, like swimming in the river with my big backpack. And so my team let me get that one. And it was like, yeah. Sam's triumph moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Go ahead, Zach. Um, yeah, I was just going to move on to the next section, uh, which is uh, like some of the Billy Billy rafting, uh, which had to be a surprise to you guys going out there that you were approaching Billy Billy rafts. Um, what was it like navigating one of those? And is there a strategy? Because I saw a lot of teams trying different things, and I'm not sure what was working. Um, it sucked. <laughs> and this, is, this should not have been a surprise, Zach, because I'm like Burton Roberts, who I did Survivor Pearl Islands with in 2003. He had, mm. you know, the previous year had done Eco Challenge, and he posted pictures on his Instagram this week of him uh, yeah. making his Billy Billy. Uh, so it's, this is not new. So it should not have been a surprise. Do your homework, mm. kids. <laughs> yeah, but where are you going to find bamboo in Illinois? Like. Uh, well, on, well I was, on Survivor, <laughs> there's bamboo laying all around where your shelter should be. So I don't know. Like, <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> yeah, so it sucked. We were on it for like 14 hours. Um, it was just slow moving. And we started in the middle of the night. Um, and then ours started sinking. Um, just it was absolutely miserable. Did you make your Billy Billy in the water or on land? On land. Okay, because like, you know, watching the episode, it, so, so some of the Fijians felt that if you make it in the water, it's better. Do you think that there's something to that or? Yeah, I, I, reckon, you could, I reckon you could get the pieces closer together. Um, yeah, uh, we, yeah, it wasn't easy. We were <laughs> expecting it because we had watched back to the episodes in Fiji. Uh, and so we, it didn't surprise us that they were getting us to do that. Uh, it was a novel idea to begin with, and then after just being soaked for so long, and we did it. We started it in the daytime. Uh, we hadn't had much sleep before that point, and when you're trying to navigate those things just through the turns and some, yeah, it, it was a really it was long. We finished in the nighttime. Had to kind of then they made you. Pull, I reckon the worst part was when they made you pull it up that horrible hill, and then you had to disassemble it. Yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I can't even just leave it. We have to now carry this thing with all our packs up this massive, muddy, slippy hill, break it apart, and then for us, then it poured. And then we had to set up our mountain bikes in the rain and then get on to the next leg. So why it was just like. Dis- why did you have to disassemble it? It's just what you, you don't ask questions, you just do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say it's there. I don't know, man. Like, no, it's, we, we leave no trace. Like, the, the race is no there. Trace. I presume it's something to do with that. Like, we're, who else is going to do it if we don't do it? Um, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm sure Emma and the Spanish team just had some locals do it. So, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> she was so yeah. getting the locals to help out on every turn. I was so impressed. It was <laughs> we got help too. We got help too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I just thought I like I'm no shade to her. I was impressed with how she walked into situations and saw everyone's skill sets and divvied them up and delegated. Could, could um, you guys, real quick on the Billy bit, could you guys take turns sleeping on that? You know, b- being as, as long as they were and, and you know, with two people per Billy Billy or, or no? We didn't do that. 
I mean, I was useless on the Billy Billy. Like I just could not figure out how to paddle it. And so I was with Cliff and there is at one point he goes, you're actually doing more harm by paddling. So can you please stop? <laughs> so did you get a nap? <laughs> no, like I just sat there then. And, and, I would have taken. It would have been like no problem. <laughs> we, we we did actually buy some paddles out there, but yeah. they were basically like doing. So it was it, it was super heavy, like, like what Team AR Georgia Hunter did, but they were so heavy. I felt like I was doing a, a press up every time, and like I'm my, my upper body strength isn't the greatest, and I would say in that first couple of days of the race we were using our upper body, like Corey and I who like, like to use our legs. Like I was just like, can we please get on land? Can we get on land and <laughs> yeah. use my leg muscles? <laughs> because like I was, we were just doing like, it, it was pretty hardcore. It looks miserable. I'm like, man, I go canoeing like once every 20 years. And it's like, I go on like a two mile canoe and I'm like, damn, this shit's kind of sucks. And you <laughs> I'm watching this. I'm like, God, I'm a wuss dude. Like, yeah, but this got, is the thing, like, life. even, like, a lot of the races out there wouldn't have spent much time on the water beforehand. Um, I think it's more accessible to be on a bike or to be on foot. Obviously, the real adventure racing teams that have done plenty of water stuff. Um, but it's amazing how, like, what you would never even conceive in your normal life, if you get thrown to a situation where you're essentially forced to be on the water for 14 hours if you want to keep staying in the race, you just do it. And I guess when you ask me the question of, like, why do I love this? Because it shocks me, like, what we actually can do when your team has such a really, like, embedded mission to keep getting to the finishing line. So we see Dan the, from the Oregon team basically has heat stroke. We, we see early on they're killing it, they're kicking ass, but that was kind of a, a bad strategy. He overheated, and he's having trouble – getting his body temperature down. So how scary is that to be on the verge of how Dan was? You know what I mean? Like are, you guys are adventure racers. So like if your temperature gets up, is it hard to get back down to where you can actually physically race the race? I mean, it depends on if your team is going to drag you along or if they're going to let you stop for a minute and uh, try to cool off. Mm -hmm. And so, like, <laughs> like, luckily they've raced together enough that, like, they know that he could continue on and they weren't going to, like, kill him. Um, whereas, like, on our team, if something like that would have happened, I don't know that we would have been able to push our teammates like that because, like, we had only spent a three-day weekend together. And then the next time that we were all together was in Fiji. So, like, we don't know how each of our teammates reacts to the heat or whatever. So, um, like, for him, I don't think it was that scary for him. Um, but for maybe us, it would have been. It was. They put, like, a leash around him and we're pulling him yeah, right. on the trekking. I, I was really worried something bad was going to happen to him. But you're right. They knew their limits. And, Corey, when we get to the spoiler section, I definitely want to ask, because your team had an interesting decision that had to be made. And I'd love to... Here's some of your perspective, given that you didn't know this people so well. I, I had no idea. So. so like with Dan, do you, do you think his body was was the his biggest obstacle? Like being because he, he seems like one of the bigger racers out there. Do you, do you think just being that big and pushing himself that hard that that's what led to to where he was at? Or, or I mean, because I, I can't imagine anyone there is in poor condition. No, but there's different body sizes for sure. And I think what's important to remember is um, ad ad adventure racing really does um, release a lot of cortisone. And so people are very likely to have like, you know, um, softer stomachs or a little bit of retention of fluids in the stomachs. Um, it's not the healthiest sport. Um, you can train in moderation and be healthy, but the sport itself when you're racing isn't, I would say, you know, the greatest. Uh, and so for Dan, I just think they, they went out too hard. Like, it's as simple as that. They, they went out too hard on the water. They were really excited. They trained really hard. Their goal was to dominate. And they knew that there was, was their strength and they were trying to capitalise on it. But, you know, it's a long, long, long race. And I think what was so awesome about seeing Team New Zealand is they know about pacing. And if I was in the top of the field, I would never let myself in the early days of a race be ahead of Team New Zealand. They would be like... If I was there, I'd be like, if I'm ahead of them, then maybe I'm doing something a little bit wrong right now. So, how, like you say, how adventure is, is is not very good for you. 
when you're done with the race, how long does it take for you to get back to a normal, just kind of, you know, physical state of mind? <laughs> That's a good question, actually. <laughs> Two hours, three hours. Yeah, totally. no, but, <laughs> but on Survivor, it's like I got home and it took a long time for me to adapt to normal life. But this is like way gnarlier, in my opinion, than Survivor. So well, like, I think the physical, I, like I, I think there's a mental, mental aspect to to uh, the world's toughest race. However, there, there's a completely different mind fuck going on with with Survivor. Kind of, yeah. I mean, having someone who's on both, um, world's toughest race is definitely physically harder and mentally harder with the sleep deprivation. But you've got to, hopefully you're in a team of people who you care about and you can lean yeah. on and you trust what they say. There is nothing more damaging to someone's mindset than being around people that you can't trust and believe in. That that breaks our need as human beings to belong. And in an adventure race, hopefully what you feel with your team is you belong. Mm -hmm. um, and even though Corey didn't like know his teammates well, like I from our conversation on, on my podcast, like you guys felt like you belonged with each other. Uh, and that counts for so much. Do you think there's an advantage to not knowing your teammates, Corey, or a disadvantage? Um, I don't think it's either. Um, you know, it can be a great thing when you're like, cool, like we are all in for this adventure and we have no idea what's going to happen. So let's just figure it out as we go. Um, whereas like some of the other teams, just from watching some of it, like I don't know that knowing their teammates is always the greatest thing um and so like i don't know like yeah i really don't know i've well, only done one talking I mean, a little like, bit about recovery and how long it took mentally and physically to bounce back from this you guys have both done uh incredibly long tough runs before uh cory you were just talking about doing uh the ice age trail recently sam you've run across india you both, I've heard you talk about your bodies adapting on those runs, that um, things start to like get in more of a flow. Did that happen with the World's Toughest Race or did it just get harder and harder? And did that impact your recovery? Uh, we never really got into a flow on the World's Toughest Race, I guess, just because it's like, as you're figuring out one of the elements, then they're like, oh, but now you're done with that. Now you're going on to something else. And so because of that, it was always just like keeping us on our toes for 12 to however many hours at a time. Um, so it was, it's different than like when you're doing the same thing over and over and over. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I kind of, I, I typically personally get stronger the, the later into the race that I go. At the beginning, um, when everyone's got like mass adrenaline and you're in a team of three guys who have like testosterone, um, there's like excitement um, and I'm like, oh, I'm trying so hard to keep up. I'm trying so hard to keep up, which is great for me that we're all in the one craft to begin with because they couldn't have got, they couldn't have gone off ahead of me. I mean, our team wouldn't do that, but I definitely, I'm pushing a bit more at the beginning. Uh, and then by like day six or day seven, I'm like, okay, I, I get what this is. Like my body gets that it's not sleeping much. My body gets that it's like eating this kind of food. My body gets that I've just got to keep moving forward. And you're not going that fast. Like you're really not moving like we would move and we're doing an ultra marathon race. Um, you're kind of like zombies, zombies well, that are moving forward. <laughs> I want to ask something. And, and uh, yeah. on Survivor, when we had to take dumps, we took them in the water. It's called aqua dumping. And then obviously, like we just pissed wherever. So as far as going to the, I mean, every we all go to the bathroom. So what is that like? Do you just like go i mean is your body actually going to the bathroom i know some people on survivor didn't go to the bathroom for like 15 freaking days oh, so 12, how is all days on my first season before my first bowel week. movement so like what's it like going to the bathroom for you guys in a race like this yeah such a good question i almost can't remember that part of it i do have really bad diarrhea at one point in the, um on one of the trekking legs when we had the fijians helping us um, that was really awesome. I needed to go to the bathroom a lot. I was like, sorry, guys, just stop one moment. I just need to, like, remove everything that's inside of me, outside of me. Yeah. Um, well, leave, but, leave no trace. So what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> we, we, we've got a trowel. We've got a little um, a shovel thing. Okay. Um, 
but uh, so, yeah, I can't. Besides that, I can't really remember that being like w when something doesn't work, you really remember it. When things are going normal, I I just can't remember to be honest. Yeah, yeah. no, it's just interesting because a lot of people ask me like when playing Survivor, like where do you go to the bathroom? Where do you do this? And it's like, man, you just do. You go into survival mode. You just do what what you got to do. But uh, man, I don't know. I mean, could anyone that like if Johnny Fairplay and myself and a couple other Survivor contestants or Zach or a race like this, like or and Zach, like does it, if you don't train for something like this, do you have a shot in hell at even remotely completing any of these legs? Well, yeah, I guess that there's so much more. It's not just about physical ability. Um, so maybe you guys have this magic physical ability that I don't know about or you've well, got I mean, grit. But if one of you doesn't know how to navigate, no. Like it doesn't matter yeah. how fit you are, if you don't have a good navigator, you're going to be going around in circles. Can so you, it's a, it, it, it depends what the combination of the team has. Um, can you there can be someone who's not. Own? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish in moments. Yeah, it, it's um you want a complementary skill sets, which I reckon Corey's team, I reckon that's why you, you guys, did so well like um because you just you all had different things that you were good at so bring that all together and someone can lead in a different moment absolutely Form, forming like voltron i love it yeah so well, zach i need you to start taking a compass class that's <laughs> I, I need to learn the navigation cool no i, yeah. I think the fourth we'll just find a fourth who already knows how to do that i'm gonna yeah, run right, right. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe karen <laughs> here we go we got it we're set. before we wrap up i have to ask both of you about how your races end because they were both epic moments in the show um so matt if you're if you're really gonna mute here uh go for it oh are you really oh hold on i got i got one more question before you before you because I, I i don't want it i don't want it to be ruined for me either okay but so my last question is uh uh getting back to the elements was what happened weather wise as, as you know I, i'm i'm through episode six or on episode six or so like up to there uh i know that we we have a uh um the you know the races stopped for hours because of the flooding in the ravine at the end of episode two was that kind of the weather expected for those that week or or whatever or, or was that kind of a little extra or where where was that element wise for for what you guys had prepared for to what you guys saw? Um, I mean, I think that's pretty much normal for that time of year on that side of the island. Um, a lot of the locals when we first got to town were saying like, "Oh yeah, you're going to the rainy side." Hmm. Okay, I think so we were lucky with I think we were lucky with the weather. To be honest, yes, there was pouring rain, but I I think it can be a lot worse. Okay, because like I mean, like you see, like the you know the uphill you know peanut butter mud trip, and I'm, and I'm just like, why is a bike even part of this? <laughs> I mean, like all yeah. all a bike is at this point is is weight. <laughs> that's my that's my one regret in the race. I wish I just disassembled my bike and found a way of strapping it to me. But you know, you, you, your brain goes, this is a mountain bike leg, so there must be a moment when I'm going to be able to use my mountain bike. And we obviously used it to get to that point, but you just, it's amazing how long you'll persist at what you think something needs to look like. Even though like I was caked in head to toe in mud and I'm like every two steps, I was cleaning out the wheels to be able to move it forward. And then I carried it for six hours over my head. And I wish that I just broke it apart and like found a way of fixing it to my back. How, how, how easily could you have done that? Uh, easier than carrying it, to be honest, because I'm I'm under five foot. Like carrying a bike's not the most easiest thing. I feel yeah. like I could have I could have rigged it up a little bit better. Um, and most teams, even you know, sometimes there was sometimes a guy carrying two bikes, but I think most of the time everyone was kind of doing their part. Um, you know, it, it, that was a really, really, really hard leg. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't want to, like, as I said, like if, if that's, if that's what that leg of the race is just like, do you need your bike later? Can you, you need to keep everything with you. Yeah. Oh, and last thing. So like, say you, you know, you're done with like a bike, you, you know, that there's no more bike legs and you're, and you're, you're, 
you're at a uh, you're near F Fijian Village. Can you give them your bike or no? Hmm. Hmm. You never know what's coming. You don't really know. Like, yeah, I mean, I didn't think of that. But you have to get to an aid station. You kind of have to get to a checkpoint. I, I don't. You could have given them. You could have given your bike away at the very end of the race in terms of. When your bike's got brought to you, you could have um, consciously gone, I'm now going to go and donate my bike. But I think mid-race, you just you just keep on to your equipment. You don't know what's going to happen. Okay. Okay. So just curious. Like, as I said, like, you know, if, if you're, if, 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 if you knew it's just like, okay, there's no more bike after this and, and, you know, and there, and you can see, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the last house of the village, you know, right. There's just like, Hey, who wants a bike? <laughs> Free bike. <laughs> Come get it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, All right. I, 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 don't, I don't want to be spoiled, Zach. So we'll I go will into the spoiler zone real quick. Um, What's so that? We'll go into the spoiler zone real quick. So remove your headphones if you don't want to hear how their races end. Okay. Are you going to bring us back or is this I it? I, I'll wave at you when I'm done. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, Corey, you guys end up uh, dropping out because of Cliff's bike accident. Can you just walk me through what happened there and what was going through your head? Yeah. Um, so we were coming like down a hill. Um, and so Sam, Chris, and I were all just slightly ahead of Cliff. Um, and I actually hit this rut that was in the road and like kind of lost control of my bike, but I was able to keep it on the road and was able to continue on. So like I almost went down and I was like, oh, this isn't gonna be good. So Cliff had just stopped to pee at the top of the hill, then he was coming down and apparently he hit that same rut that I hit, but it took him and flung him off the bike. Um, and we were already up the road. And so after like a minute, we're just like, hmm, like this is weird. He's normally right behind us, just a little bit slower on the uphills, but no big deal. So like we said there for maybe two or three minutes and we're like, okay, something's wrong. So I went back first and I just found him laying in the ditch. Um, so it's like, okay, like, here we go. He was kind of getting up and like looking for bike pieces and stuff. And I'm like, Hey, you know, like what happened? Then Sam and Chris also came up and we're just like, all right, like let's go into find gear mode, check on cliff, make sure he's okay. Check the helmet. And so Sam checked the helmet and noticed that it was cracked. And so that's when it's like, okay, this is a lot bigger deal than we thought it was going to be. So um, at that point it was like, all right, we'll just look for the rest of the bike pieces. Sam was doing like little evaluation on Cliff to see, um, just to see like how coherent he was, I guess. And um, we had to either decide to go back to camp two or continue on to the next checkpoint. But the issue was like, we didn't know what sort of services would be at the next checkpoint, whereas we knew there's still some medical staff at uh, camp too. So we decided to walk it back there and um, they determined that it was probably a concussion. And that, so they took him to the hospital. Um, but before we went to the hospital, it was like, okay, we need to decide, do we want to continue racing? Um, would we be able to find a second helmet for him? Like how bad is his vision? How bad is his head? Like all of this. And the part that was kind of concerning was he thought he hit the right side of his head, but the left side of his helmet was cracked. Um, and he couldn't quite tell us exactly like what he hit or how it happened. And so at that point we had to make the decision, like, you know, it's probably better to, uh, be safe and, you know, not kill a teammate out in the jungle, um, rather than continue on. That's a good call, but the show would have let you keep going. Um, if we would have been able to find a helmet, then um, we would have been able to continue on because we had all the other gear we needed except for um, the helmet. But the medical staff there is like, hey, you know, like we really do think it's concussion. Like you probably should go um, to the hospital. And like the big deciding factor in that was also that he had had a concussion like three months earlier. Um, and so at that point, it's like, you know, it's just a risk on all of us. Yeah. So how did you feel since you didn't know these people all that well, did you feel like you could have your voice heard? And like in this, this just feels so awkward to me. I feel like I wouldn't know what to say to my teammates here as Cliff was trying to make that decision. 
Yeah. Um, so the good news is like we, before the race, we talked about our goals and like the mission and like the message we wanted to send across. And so like one of the big things was we wanted to make sure we were all safe throughout this whole thing. And so, um, Sam and I definitely were both like, yes, like this is a concussion. Like we should not continue on. Chris is like, yeah, let's leave it up to the racer. So, you know, if Chris, <clears throat> excuse me, if Cliff really wanted to go on, then, uh, Chris would have supported that decision. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where it's like, if you have people that don't feel comfortable dealing with that, um, cause I mean, it just becomes a liability basically out in the jungle. Then, um, you know, we all were like, we will respect each other's opinions though. Um, and so the kind of like the thing that sealed the deal was our team crew person was Michaela, who is Cliff's daughter. Um, and she definitely didn't want him going back out there either. So, um, I think it was a great call to make. Yeah. I was going to say having his daughter there made that one of the most moving moments of the show. I thought having to see you guys decide not to go on for his safety. It was awesome. And your team, uh, you know, you can tell it's kind of the Avengers team. All four of you guys were great television. I think most of the teams that got heavily featured, there were like one or two people talking. All four of you uh, just gave mm. great interviews, really compelling characters on the show. A nice job. Yeah. And then Tim, you guys do end up finishing and you guys place, I think 24th. Is that correct? To be honest, I, at 25th maybe, 26th, we're not 100% sure where we placed. I can't recall exactly. I jotted something 20th. Yeah. All right. Mm. And you orchestrated, uh, we caught a glimpse of it on the show, your child Harry was there when you guys crossed the line, correct? He was. It was um, basically the week before the event. I called my parents and I was like, I really want you guys to come. We had talked about it in advance, but... You know, they were you know, my husband and I were both doing the race, and so my parents were looking after our son, and they decided to fly over uh, with him. And I was only going to tell Mark if he wanted to quit. Oh, do you know that you know Harry's going to be at the finishing line? You've got to keep going. I had it in my left pocket just in case. Um, cool. Never needed to say it, and so it was a surprise when we were like paddling in that final part. We were totally out of it and like little Harry's running down the beach and it was just amazing. That's epic. Uh, very cool. I'm glad you had got to have him there and got to experience that. Let me try to bring Matt and Johnny back in. There's Matt. Awesome. Uh, well, Matt, we've talked about all the stuff that you have yet to experience as you check out the rest of World Stuff is Crazy. Yeah. Go I, can, I cannot wait. You guys, you guys are freaking amazing. And as a viewer I am blown away, and my my two little boys. I have an eleven year old son, and a thirteen year old son, and my wife. We love watching it. It's truly inspiring, and as Survivor fans, it really brings us those uh, things that we once would see on early seasons of Survivor. So, thank you guys very much. Um, very entertaining, very awesome, and for me, just talking to you guys on the podcast is has been a true uh treat and a true highlight so thank you very much for coming on thanks for having us yeah. awesome. and here comes fair but here comes fair play okay. we're done with the spoilers johnny okay Whew. thank goodness Hello, Greg. Really, i love this show so much i don't want it like it, it so many people love spoilers and i'm just like why do you want the last chapter before you you get chapters four five and six like i don't you know like i i so I uh, I will go back and listen. I, I'm anxiously looking forward to hearing you, you guys making it to the end of the race, beating Team New Zealand somehow. It, uh, obviously, that's what happened. It is true. We picked them at the post <laughs> the very, very end. Just yeah. They just couldn't. <laughs> I blame, I blame Nathan. Right on. I blame Nathan. I, I think, uh, you know, the poor leadership, I think, is... Uh, <laughs> 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 don't tell him I said that. I he there there's something like you 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 made the Michael Jordan comparison earlier, Zach. There there he has that Michael Jordan look in his eye of a guy that does not lose, and mm -hmm. and it's just you know there there's there's very few people in, in in the world as we've known it, like you know your Ronda Rousey's and your Michael Jordans. They they just have that that unbeatable spirit and attitude that that wills them to be the absolute best. And, and you just see that in Nathan's eyes uh, when ev every second he looks in the, into that camera. So, so I'm, I'm sorry that, that he, you know, is, he led his team astray and that, you know, he's a failure. 
So, <laughs> so, so congratulations for, uh, to you two for beating him. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that glad that you guys crossed the finish line at the exact same time and won. I think that's really we awesome. did. We we formed an alliance. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, that, that, it's the best alliance you could get out there. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you brought something from Survivor with you. <laughs> So, so where can everybody find you guys on social media? And 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 only only follow and 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 uh, message these uh, these these kind folks if you have nice things to say. If not, please check out of the podcast now. <laughs> Never listen to us again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm um just well, my name's so at Samantha Gash, one word on Instagram. Yeah, and I am at Corey Woltering on Instagram. Awesome. And I'll put links to your guys' uh, podcast and websites and everything in the comments. Cool. Awesome. And, cool. and, and, and last question uh, for you, Corey. Uh, are you glad that you went with a mostly Speedo attire for, for <laughs> as your wardrobe uh, uh, choice? Yeah, absolutely. We as the view as a viewer, we are too. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for listening. Uh, this has been Survivor NSFW talking world's toughest race eco challenge with Samantha Gash and Corey Waltering. Cheers. Thanks, guys. <laughs>